neon sign blinks red light in through the window, pressing against the ceiling like a kiss. My fourth floor perch affords me a bird's eye view of the square below. Other than a few hopeful restaurants, all the shops have been closed for hours. A handful of couples and small groups huddled together against the late night chill. For their sakes, and that of my surveillance, I'm glad there's no rain. I set aside the scope for the night. It's been the same thing every eight hours. My mark comes into the square, walks to the northeast corner from the south side parking garage. She wears a black thigh length coat, a scarf with poppies over her hair and tied below her chin like a babuska belies her true age. She wears dark Jackie O sunglasses in the daytime and clutches a red Hermes bolide bag before her like a beacon. She blends in like a blinking stop sign. Each time she stands near a baker's awning, but not underneath it, facing northwest. She waits approximately 15 minutes. Occasionally, she checks her watch. Before returning to the garage, she glances toward the fountain at the center of the square like she's looking for a signal. Not very imaginative, but at least she's consistent and reliable. It makes my life easier. Easier is why I went private. Having served with the Army Infantry through two Iraq deployments and one to the hills of Afghanistan, I segued into the police force. After walking a beat for a little while, I opted to enter a field with fewer daily obligations. We each have our scars. We are each broken in some way. Unseen by passers-by on the street, the effect of those years I spent on the front line shines brightly enough in more intimate shadows. At least I came home in one piece, though perhaps not entirely whole. In contrast to my previous life, these innocuous surveys into the lives of cheating spouses and embattled siblings are a blessing. It may still get a bit dirty at times, but at least the dirt under my nails is no longer rust-colored. The mark with the Jackie O sunglasses and expensive bag is Melinda St. Clair, my client's twin sister. Their deceased father left a bit of a treasure hunt in the form of a pair of silly riddles describing locations to a beloved trinket a 19th century mason figure worth about $25,000. The sister figured hers out. My client did not. Since my client believes her twin is set on destroying the figurine once she gets a hold of it, something my client does not want to happen, I am meant to recover and safeguard the little porcelain figure. The assignment is intended to be just a simple gotcha setup, really in which I watch and wait in the hope of intercepting and talking reason into the sister by way of a cash offering. The only complication is that I happen to be dating my client. It's not my usual M.O., but my client can be very persuasive. As I'm pouring myself a drink, a playful beat raps on the door. I cross the room and put my eye to the peephole. Cecilia stands in the hallway looking as though she shouldn't be anywhere else, fiercely chewing gum, her jacket slung over her shoulder like a pelt. At the edge of my fisheye view, I see the handles of a shopping bag languidly dangling from her fingertips. I remove the bar and pull open the door. She's five feet eleven inches of dark legs and lean muscle, her face full of partial smiles and smoky eyes. She captures the nonchalance of entitlement as only a trust fund child could. I brought snacks, my pet, she purrs, patting into the room and brushing her lips across my cheek. She takes the drink from my hand and upends it into her mouth. Though it's been roughly six months since we first met at an art exhibition she curated, I remain shaken by her. I release the door. As it swings shut, a porcelain hand appears to stop it. A lamb of a woman tentatively pushes the door open and slides in. Um, hi, she says. Excuse me. The woman has strawberry-colored hair and wears a pale yellow shirt and dark gray slacks under a black overcoat. She eases past me and enters the room. Oh, this is Beth. Cecilia says, as though she forgot she had company. From the gallery. 
Cecilia drops her bag of edibles on the desk and her jacket across the back of the room's only chair. I trust that my dear sister has come and gone? Like clockwork, I say. I raise my eyes in Beth's direction. She's an intern, Cecilia says, plopping onto the bed. Beth settles into the chair. I put a toothpick into my mouth. I could really use a smoke about now. I trust Cecilia, but I also like my routines, especially while on the job. Cece, Peach, is it such a good idea to bring Miss Garrison, Beth informs me, to bring Miss Garrison here with you? I refill my glass and motion an offer of one to Beth. She holds out her hand, so I pour another two fingers in a second glass and hand it to her. Oh, don't be such a prude, Cecilia chuffs. I'm just suggesting perhaps this isn't the best location for your employee to be this evening. She's not my employee. Cecilia sits up and gives a mock look of surprise. I told you, she's an intern. Her paycheck is in the form of a grade with her university. I do have my standards. She falls back to the mattress. Besides, she's practically in love with me. Isn't that right, Bethy? Cecilia rolls onto her side and props her mane of a head in her hand. You've wanted to get into my panties since you first came to the gallery. Beth flushes deep red at Cecilia's crassness, but doesn't speak. Art students are all the same. Cecilia continues contemptuously. Maybe we'll pop that sweet cherry sometime, but tonight you'll be a good little intern and just watch and learn. She emphasizes her statement by blowing a large bubble with her gum. Beth smiles sheepishly to herself through her crimson blushing. I glance between the two, feeling like a tomato in a fruit basket. Oh, don't be modest, my cub, Cecilia says. I've told her all about you. My ears ring with the flood of my pulse. Psychological disfigurement has left me with a non-fatal flaw. Though I may have the will, I have no way, traditionally speaking. This has caused me no small amount of anxiety and conflict in previous relationships. Feelings are always being examined, blame always attributed, that sort of thing. It is not so with Cecilia. The only cardinal sin in her carnal cosmology is a lack of imagination. I'm not pleased to hear that she has shared my secret. However, it is the least of my troubles. That isn't what concerns me exactly, I tell her, glancing also at Beth. In contrast to Cecilia's smooth, tawny-hued, long limbs, Beth is fair, pinkish almost. She appears shy, though not uneasy, a Mona Lisa smile on the bow of her lips. She reclines into her seat, watching me as one might watch the effect of the wind. I turn back to Cecilia as she reaches down along her hip and thigh, teasing the hem of her skirt. I forewarn myself to not mix business with pleasure again once this job is completed. The risks are too great. But my God... Though the spirit is strong, the flesh is weak. I put my drink on the desk next to Beth's chair and kneel at Cecilia's altar. She leans forward, kisses me deeply. I pull her to the edge of the bed. The evening deepens into a purple twilight. Eventually, velvety sleep engulfs us. The sun also rises. I see reflections of a giant tangerine shining on the buildings to our west. It appears warm outside, but I know it's an illusion. Beth stands in front of the bathroom mirror, buttoning her blouse. I watch her dab on lipstick with her finger. She notices me, but doesn't startle. She does that thing where she rubs her top lip around on the bottom to even out the color before placing the tube into her purse. Cecilia continues sleeping as I slip out of bed. I start some coffee in the room's miniature pot and begin positioning the scope. Want a cup? I offer. No thanks. I've got to go. She gathers her few belongings and tiptoes to the door. Sorry, she says, slipping out into the hallway. 
I assume she means her serendipitous escape. Mm. Cecilia purrs from the covers, stirred from her dreams by the door closing. Is it almost time? I glance down at the square. We can expect your lovely and very punctual doppelganger shortly. Since Melinda is yet to arrive, I pour the coffee and start another two-cup pot. I return to the window and see her just then emerge into the square. Her red bag flashes against the black of her coat. Here she comes now. What's she doing? Cecilia asks, scratching curls from her head. Same as always, waiting, looking around. I sip my coffee. I see a man approaching Melinda. He steps up close. Well, here's something new. What? Cecilia's eyes widen in anticipation. Looking through the scope now, I tell her about the stranger. Cecilia claps her hands like a kid. I just knew it would be this morning. The man holds out a brown package. Melinda unwraps the paper to inspect the object before forcefully pushing the whole thing into her bag. I move away from the scope and sit on the bed to put on my shoes. Cecilia gives me an excited hug from behind. She climbs out from the covers, grabs a t-shirt from my open luggage, and takes up Sentinel in the chair I've moved in front of the window. I have approximately ten minutes to intercept Melinda before she leaves the garage. I check my hip pocket to ensure the envelope containing Cecilia's payoff is there. Cecilia sits looking through the scope as I pull on my jacket. What are you doing? She cries out. Not to me. I return to the window. I don't have the close-up view Cecilia has, but I still easily make out that Beth has approached Melinda in the square. They exchange a few words, and then Beth grabs at Melinda's bag. They struggle for a moment. We don't hear the shot, but what happens is unmistakable. Beth holds onto the bag as Melinda crumbles to the ground, pulling her arm as it slides from shoulder to wrist and then off. Cecilia roars. Her hands fly to her eyes. I watch Beth stand a moment more, looking down at Melinda in disbelief. She pulls the straps of the bag onto her shoulder and steps carefully around the body, angling toward the parking garage. The crowd, which is held back up to this point, rushes to the bleeding Melinda. There's nothing to be done for her. Blood spilling out that quickly isn't going back in. My experience suggests that the bullet has passed through her liver. Rivlets of bright red run through the chinks in the cobblestone with a slurry of what life she may have lived. Cecilia falls back in the chair, her panting leading to sobs. I move close, kneel and put my hands on either side of her head, my fingers in her wild hair. Cece, we've got to go. No, no, no! She mostly growls, looking through me. That wasn't supposed to happen. See, listen. Someone in that crowd down there will have called the police. She focuses her icy blue eyes on me, her pupils practically pinpoints. The whites are already bloodshot, but I suspect the welling of tears has only just begun. If we have any chance of getting ahead of this, we need to get moving. I stand and pull her to her feet. As she pushes through her fogginess to dress, I gather up my equipment and pack my luggage. A last look around the room. It seems much smaller, as it often does when things go pear-shaped. For all it's worth, we get out of the hotel and away from downtown without incident. I call an old colleague at the precinct and give them a quick lowdown on what's what. At least they won't need to start from scratch. I only talk shop. I don't tell him my personal connection to the women. Cecilia's in shock, and it's difficult getting information or any original ideas out of her. I drive around in circles looking for Beth's car, a red Honda Civic. I find about 50 of them none containing a petite, fair-complexioned murderess. We wind by the gallery, 
the block on which she lives, the university, nothing. Morning passes. Around noon, a detective calls us in. They aren't making any progress either. I smoke several cigarettes before going in. Cecilia and I spend the next eight hours giving testimonies to the men and women in blue. I doubt it helps them much. We enter Cecilia's apartment. Evening's dark billows in through the windows. We drag ourselves to her bedroom and quietly remove our clothes as though shedding the day. We climb into her bed and pull the covers over us. Cecilia curls into me. I press into her. Our bodies knot together. This universal drive, this celestial biology, warms us within our shared chrysalis. We sleep. The mason figurine had been one of a pair, a man and a woman. Residual adrenaline and a full day without eating has woken us after only a few blessed hours of rest. I collect a couple of bottles of water from the fridge and bring the bag of food to the bedroom. We assuage our guilty hunger in silence. Now Cecilia sits against the headboard, relating her history. The blanket pulled at her waist serves as my pillow as I listen. Our grandmother, my father's mother, that is, gave them as a wedding present. The figures are both white, of course. I'm sure it was meant as a rebuke. My father's family was old money and very old school when it came to marriage. Our mother didn't care about opinion. Whatever my grandmother had intended with the gift, my mother received them as she wanted. She proudly displayed the figurines in a curio cabinet alongside a silver frame containing their contrasting wedding photo. My father loved her for it. After she died, my father threw the male figure against a wall. She takes a bottle from the nightstand and sips. It was the day of the memorial. I was on the couch looking out the window and watching our aunt, Marguerite, get into her car. She was the last to leave when smash, I nearly jumped out of my skin. Cecilia offers the bottle to me before returning it to the nightstand. Melinda was in the kitchen, but came into the living room when she heard the crash. Marguerite. Cecilia pauses, contemplating something as her fingers trace along my arm. I hadn't met her before that day. We didn't really interact much with mother's side of the family. Marguerite was two years older, but looked just like my mother, though slightly darker. All my other aunts and uncles, and by extension cousins, were fair, many of them blonde. Melinda and I were the exceptions, of course. Coffee poured into the cream, she spat. So as you can imagine, I was instantly infatuated. I stayed in her shadow the whole day. I kind of wonder if I thought she was my mom. You know? Her voice grew thick. She brushed her hand across her eyes and sniffed away tears. I didn't say anything. Eventually, she continued. He just looked at me, my dad, with this blank expression and gave a perfunctory, guess she won't need that anymore. He walked to his bedroom with his hands in his pockets, and that was that. Didn't even notice Melinda standing there. We sort of lost our dad that day. Something hard and sharp resided in our father. Our mother softened his edges and tethered him. Whatever animal he wrestled with, Melinda and I couldn't do what mother did. We were too young. I sat up and pulled Cecilia to me, letting her head rest on my shoulder. He valued competition above almost anything in life, she continued. So he raised competitors, predators, to give us an edge in life, he'd say. Always pitting us against one another, he'd never praise us, but we were rewarded. More like oppositional forces than sisters. Forget about the whole twin connection. Father took care of it to sever that. Like he had a greater urge to break than to forge. I think it's why I had such a visceral pull to Beth, she pauses. 
and to some extent, to you. She looks at me directly to see if I'm following her. I'm not entirely sure I am, but I nod anyway. When she came to the gallery asking for an internship, I was immediately taken in by her soft, fawning innocence. I had a bit of a big sister thing for her, equal parts protective and corruptive. Another pause as she considers what she said. It didn't take long before I stopped playing our dad's games. Melinda, however, continued, hoping to win favor. She had goaded me into doing better, to try harder, just so she could beat me fairly. I didn't want the money or prizes he offered. I just wanted our dad as he had been when mom was alive. I wanted affection and love. She blows at some hair that has fallen in her face and is quiet a moment more. Well, anyway, I learned to take what I needed. He never offered it on his own, but he wouldn't deny me of it necessarily. My slight discomfort at what I infer must have alerted her because she laughs and says, Oh, no, no, nothing inappropriate. I just meant he would indulge my hugs but never initiate them. He had accept kisses but not return them, and I gave a lot of them. She kisses me. Melinda couldn't do that. She wouldn't reach out. She was too analytical, too black and white like him. Our father could be a real bastard, but I accepted him in a way Melinda couldn't. She had just performed, racking up baubles of reward to put on her shelf. I understood what he had risked by loving our mother and what he had lost when she died. With that context, it helped me to love him despite how he treated us. I actually do want a memento, this figurine. I don't think she did. When we got his stupid riddles at the reading, I proposed coordinating a shared strategy. However, we weren't trained to cooperate. She feigned nonchalance like it meant nothing to her, but I know, knew, her better than that. This whole thing was just one last game. Whoever figured it out first got the prize, and she was still willing to play. She needed to win before I could approach her. Cecilia's phone vibrates on the nightstand. It's still dark outside, and I don't know what time it is. She fumbles for the call, her voice husky as she answers. Where are you? she asks, kneading my thigh. She turns her phone to speaker. It's windy wherever the call is originating. I reach for my watch. It's just after five. The sun is still almost two hours from making an appearance. I'm so sorry, Beth is saying. I don't know what to do. Cecilia tries to calm her as I push out of bed and begin dressing. Before hanging up, Cecilia has managed to convince Beth to give her location and promise to wait for us. We rush out. Our drive ahead may just beat the daylight. We reach Beth at the Devil's Punch Bowl Coastal Overlook. The wind is cold and the air moist. Beth's appearance suggests she's been here a while. Her eyes are bleary with emotion, her hair frizzy from the ocean breeze. Her hands are in her coat pockets. Even over the sound of the wind and waves, I hear a slight tinkling as of jewels being fondled. I have a feeling I know what she's holding on to. Though the sky is beginning to glow, the western horizon is still a darkened smile on the other side of the Pacific. Beth won't let us get too close. She inches toward the cliff any time we move forward. We're not talking much either. It's like strangers waiting for a mutual friend to arrive and connect us. You probably don't remember it, but we met after your mother died. Beth says to Cecilia once the silence has almost become unbearable. You must have been about eleven or twelve. It was my mother's store. Your father brought you in to look at dresses. He seemed to take up the whole world. He was well dressed 
and very handsome. You and Melinda looked beautiful. Beautiful and so wonderfully bored, like dolls, really. Beth brushes against the barrier fence. He shook my hand and smiled at my mother like they had a, shared a joke I didn't understand. When you left, my mom watched through the shop window and sighed. There goes your father, Bethy. That's all she would ever say about it. And believe me, I tried to get more out of her. He never came back. I couldn't put you out of my mind. Your life became my fantasy. Two police cruisers pull into the parking lot behind us. Cecilia and I hadn't called them. Beth dispassionately watches over our shoulders as the patrolmen climb from their vehicles. I motion for them to stay back. Did you know your father had another daughter? Beth asks. Cecilia shakes her head. Beth just nods and looks at the ground. I knew. She rolls a small stone with the toe of her shoe. When you first told me about how you planned to get the figurine from Melinda, Beth continues, I thought, maybe I should keep it for myself. I have nothing from him, while you two got everything. I was going to grab her bag, like you told me to, and just keep going. I don't understand Beth at first. Pieces fall into place. Why Cecilia risked bringing Beth to the room. Why she left early. I glance at Cecilia. Her face is a shadow. All of this, just a game. I didn't plan on shooting her, Beth says. You have to understand. I always have my gun in my purse and only put it in my pocket to use as a prop, in case. She shrugs her shoulders slightly. Her lips do that sideways grimace thing people do when they're holding back extreme regret. I should have gone to the garage. I should have just talked to her. I know that now. She glances back over the waves. She hasn't looked directly at us in a while, but she does now. Her brow is knitted, and her lips are held tightly. I'm so sorry. Beth draws her Ruger LCP from her pocket, pushes it under her chin, and squeezes the trigger before Cecilia or I can react. As her body crumbles, fragments of porcelain spill onto the ground. A red pool, like her sister's, spreads around the broken pieces. Cecilia cries out and falls to her knees. I hold her against me and listen to the crash of waves in the collapsed cavern of the punch bowl. We each have our scars. We are each broken in some way. Whether we're lions or lambs, how we manage to get through life knowing we're all headed to the slaughter is a mystery to me.